Hello and welcome to It Started With A Kick, the podcast in which well-known fans and high-profile figures from the world of football talk about the first match they ever attended. I'm your host, Richard Foster, and I'm really pleased to introduce today's guest, Nige Tassel. Nige's a journalist and an author who covers both sport and popular culture, especially music. Uh, and he's written for The Guardian, The Sunday Times, GQ, amongst many others. His football books include The Hard Yards, The Bottom Corner, which look at the slightly seedier sides of football, which we love, um, and his latest, Field of Dreams, which neatly encapsulates 100 years of Wembley history into 100 matches. Now, Nige, I need to have a quick prelude with you before we delve into your first match, mm -hmm. as it is one that carries an awful lot of baggage for me personally. Indeed, it is so traumatic, I almost ask you to choose your second ever match to avoid personal pain and anguish. But in the interests of objectivity... <laughs> And, you know, as journalists, we have to be objective. Absolutely. We are yeah. going to plough straight into it. So let's go for the matching question. Just read the result out uh, and okay. I'll hide away in the corner. Okay. Here. okay. The, we're, I'm taking you back to the 27th of December, 1980. Uh, the Goldston Ground in Hove. Brighton and Hove Albion 3. Crystal Palace 2. Sorry, Richard. Robbery. Robbery. <laughs> <laughs> I got I got five goals for my first game, so I couldn't I couldn't complain too much. And I was uh I wasn't particularly affiliated with either side either. So as a as a as a semi-neutral, um mm -hmm. it, it was okay. It was it's a good start. Yeah, I did uh, actually recorded um yesterday I recorded uh, the pod with Alan Smith, the ex Palace manager. Oh right, yeah. yeah. Uh, he wasn't involved with Palace at the time. His first match. Check this out. Fulham 4, Newcastle 5 in the FA Cup. How are you going back to the 1950s? So How are you not going to fall in love with football if you get that, if you get nine goals in your first game? Perfectly. So he slightly trumps you with five goals. And also, <laughs> it didn't involve Palace getting beaten. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we're going to go in full ball. So, so talk to uh, us a little bit about your memories, the incidents, the goals, and then we can go even deeper into the relative importance for both clubs, sure. which it was. Sure. So, uh, 19, I, I was born um, in the last two weeks of the year. So, the tickets for this game were a birthday present, which I'd got 11 days earlier. Um, I was harbouring, harbouring a little bit of flirting with the idea of Crystal Palace being my team. I didn't really have a team. Um, I seem to have had Chelsea foisted on me. Don't know why. My dad didn't have a team either, and, I've, and so I've, I'd never inherited one. And this was, you know, we're talking, you know, a little bit on from the team of the 80s. You know, we're talking a season on from that, which I remember, you know, Palace going top of the league with that 4-1 win over Ipswich. Um, I think Jerry Francis even blazed a penalty over the bar quite possibly in that game as well. So they could have won it by more. Um, so, so I grew up on the south coast, sort of between Brighton and Portsmouth. Um, and so when Palace, I, I mentioned that I was kind of interested in Palace. Um, and yeah, so, so when, when they came to the South coast, um, my dad got a couple of tickets, you know, back then I didn't realize there were such rivals, you know, the M23 Derby so-called is only kind of come to light since then for me. So I never knew it was going to be a necessarily hotbed of resentment and anger and fury. And I didn't really notice it on the day, to be perfectly honest. Um, I think probably just shepherded it away as a little 12 year old lad, um, that it was kind of safe, safe from that. But the games where we were sat in the south stand um, behind one of the goals, quite possibly, and I think that is probably among the Brighton fans. So any 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 happiness when Jerry Murphy scored for Palace at, at that end, I had to kind of keep under wraps. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so so I didn't I didn't kind of get to say it's, it's annoying that I was almost behind the goal. Fortunately, there were three goals at my end, so that was good. Um, but I didn't get to see you know, the managers there. We've got Mullery versus Allison, you know, because Venables had left a couple of months earlier, left Palace. Um, and I, I've been quite good to kind of really kind of observe that ballet between between the two managers and how that played out, which I go to a lot of non-league games now. And I always, for at least half a match, kind of position myself between the dugouts because if even if the game's a bit lousy, you're going to get a little bit of, you know, a little bit of spiciness between the, the two benches. So I'm always up for that. 
Um, and I remember, uh, I think Brighton took the lead um, uh, with Peter O'Sullivan goal. Jerry Murphy, always underrated player for Palace. Midfielder, really underrated. Obviously went to Chelsea later in the, the day, but this was before Chelsea were the, 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 the big uh, swanking along boys that they became. Um, really good player. Only, only three caps for Ireland as well, I think. I looked up earlier. Um, really yeah. good player. Sort of great goal. Uh, I seem to remember kind of cross field, possibly a volley cross, cross goal shot into the far corner. Um, and then the second half, it all came alive when... Michael Robinson, um, recently jettisoned uh, for, by Manchester City. Um, he scored two goals in 40 seconds. And I remember the Tannoy announcement and uh, the third goal for Brighton and his second in 40 seconds. You know, that's the kind of thing we had in kids football. When I was playing kids football at the time, you know, you get a goal every 40 seconds. So yeah. suddenly to see that, you know, you, 40 seconds, you've got barely got time to celebrate, get to, you know, reset, everyone get back to the centre circle and come again. But yeah, two goals in 40 seconds. Um, and then a John Gregory own goal in the last minute as well. So um, normally my dad would be the, the type of person who say, 10 minutes left, come on, let's let's go, let's beat the traffic. So we did <laughs> We did actually hang on then. I think we were All kind right. of sitting mid-row, so it would have been really awkward. If we were by the aisle, we probably would have slipped away. So we did see that John Gregory from a distance, from 130 yards away or whatever at the far end. Um, but yes, five goals in the first game and... Didn't notice any kind of spiciness or trouble on the way back. I mean, we drove there, um, parked, parked in the streets, in the suburban streets, the north of the ground. So possibly it would have been easier if we'd just taken the train, Hove Station being just around the corner from the old Goldstone. Um, and maybe that was my dad kind of thinking it might get a little bit tasty and therefore, you know, shielding me off and us travelling home safely in cars rather than uh, a pitch battle or whatever incurred at, uh, occurred at uh, Hove Station. Yeah, as I said to you uh, in the run-up to this, I went to a fair amount of Brighton Palace games at the Goldstone Ground, uh, and I, I literally cannot remember if I was at this one. And maybe I'm so pained by it, I just put it away and said it's gone to the oblivious uh, category. But, it, yeah, it was. It used to be quite lively. And, and I remember, you know, you used to park and then there's, there was a big park, wasn't there, right by Goldstone Grounds. So yeah, you used to yeah. walk through that park. and There used to be a, a little bit of activity sometimes. But um, I, think you're, I think you're right in, and I'm really interested in your idea of getting near to the dugouts. Um, you know, non-league, you have the luxury of being this close. So they're there. Um, and I think the Mullery Allison dynamic, let's call it, would have been pretty feisty. Now, as you say, Venables had left Palace in October uh, to go to QPR. Uh, we don't need to go into that. Um, <laughs> Took Mike Flanagan uh, with him as well. Yeah, yeah. And also Clive Allen joined him a little bit later. But as I say, we're, we're not. <laughs> and he scored against us in the FA Cup, uh, the quarter final at Loftus Road, and then ran in front of the fans. But we're not going into that much. You, you've um, not carried it with you for the past, yeah, 40 to four decades now. Yeah. The good news is I let it go. That's that's the really good news. <laughs> um, but with Alisson, he had only just joined. So he joined in early December because there was a guy called Ernie Wally who will no one will remember, probably even Palace fans won't even remember. But he did a bit of caretaking, managing. He was part of the club. But anyway, so he looked after it whilst Venables buggered off, let's say, so it's QPR. Um, then Alison had come in early December. And when you read the press reports about this match, there is a great deal behind the man who scored two goals in the space of 40 seconds. So Michael Robinson, funnily enough, had been jettisoned by Malcolm Allison when he was at Man City. And it, when you read the reports, there is a certain element of schadenfreude in Robinson celebrating, apparently, quite vigorously and possibly in front of the dugouts. But Mullery, you know, actually, I've been through this before on, on various podcasts, but Mullery is one of the main reasons why there is a Palace Brighton rivalry. Um, but as I say, we're not here just to talk <laughs> about Palace, thank God. Um, and the press reports that I dug out, and in fact, again, indebted to Tim Carter, who is the Brighton historian who keeps feeding me these Brighton press reports, which I am actually 
um, very pleased with because he helps uh, fill the picture for us. Um, Is he trying to turn you, Richard? Well, he's got a long way to do that. <laughs> to do that. But it's interesting that at, at this stage, uh, so we're coming just coming up to probably the halfway point in the season. Palace are rock bottom. As you say, the team of the 80s lasted for a week. So we beat Ipswich 4-1. We then never topped the table again. Mm -hmm. And it, this is about a year later and it's not looking that no, great. No. In fact, John Vinnikum, who's the uh, local press historian, called it something like the, something about the tag of the 80s that had been hanging around our necks anyway. So basically, Brighton were just above the relegation zone and, and they had won all three games at Christmas. This was their third game at Christmas when, you know, people played every day, basically. Well, that's that's what um, I found fascinating, is that both teams yeah. played the day before. Yeah. You know, and Mark Lawrenson had been taken off with concussion the day before and then so, put in, like, a, a one of the man, man, men of the match performance the next day. So, um, yeah, that was quite extraordinary. I think they played Leicester. So they, they'd come down from Leicester, right. obviously the night before, back to Brighton and then played again. And then Palace played, I think Palace played Arsenal. Am I remembering that? I think they didn't have to travel I've, too I've wiped it from my memory, yeah. so I can't really... But know. they were at home anyway, so it's any, it is down yeah. that, that M23, A23 anyway, isn't it? So, a short... Yeah, because in, in the report, it's and I think it's actually in the programme, it says that Lawrence had got stretched off. Right, OK. With con I mean, if you consider a concussion now, I mean, still there are a few, few issues with it, to be stretched off with concussion, not come back again, and then literally play less than 24 hours later is slightly crazy. Uh, nuts, nuts, absolutely, yeah. Nuts, that's the word. So let's have a little further look at um, the teams involved because that's also, that opens up some interesting stuff. So as you say, Michael Robinson, probably the central character, you know, 40 seconds from hell, scored twice. Um, he, and, you know, unfortunately, he died not too long ago, but he had been, you know, quite a big player. And then he, he went to Brighton uh, after being jettisoned by Man City, he'd been at Preston. But he suddenly became this, I think they described him as a battering ram centre forward, which you don't get many these days. And, and and he was quite a player, wasn't he? He was a good player. And, and I, I always knew him being slightly different as well. I think... There was an interview with him, possibly on Football Focus or something, maybe when he went to Man City, when when they spent seven and seven hundred and fifty thousand pounds on him, um, and how different he was, how he liked cooking, how he liked wine, and how he didn't pay any attention to football in you know in in the in the normal scheme of things, which we're kind of revisiting really recently with Ben White, you know, how exactly. certain players could not live that life. They can actually walk away, switch off. And go and do something, you know. Connor Roberts as well for Wales. You know, he's he's a big woodworker. He's got he's got he's got proper woodwork woodworking shop, and that's what he does. Oh, he's, right. he's, he's he's made tables for managers and stuff that he's played with. There's just a few odd characters who 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 don't immerse themselves in that culture and kind of you know are able to step outside of it. And that's what Michael did. And I always saw him as being slightly an outsider, brilliant player when he's on the pitch, but an outsider. Um, but then he went into punditry, obviously, in Spain, after he went over to play in Spain. And and this kind of indicates, you know, went, learned, to learn, to learn Spanish, able to speak Spanish to a point where you can present programmes on Spanish television. And you're not just reading an autocue, you know, dealing with an analysts and, you know, having proper discussions. So that kind yeah. of put him, you know, where most players would go abroad and maybe, you know, learn a bit of pidgin Spanish or a bit of pidgin German or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, so he always stood stood slightly apart, and I thought, always thought that was quite fascinating, actually, um, how how being at the time 11, 12, and just loving football, and football being the, the only thing I thought about, waking up to going to sleep to dreaming, you know, unconsciously football was was there. The fact that a grown man who's paid to do this, this great job, to wear the number nine shirt, play for his country as well, could just switch that off. I found that really kind of... Slightly alien because I was eleven and twelve. Thought there's nothing more in the world, but um, you know it's quite interesting. Really interesting character, and you're a fantastic broadcaster. And the tributes that came in when he did pass away, you know, from, from both in Spain and and back in over here and in Ireland, you know, were were yeah, you know, showing what a, what a lovely man he really was. 
exactly. And, and maybe when he left, you know, he put his boots in his bag and went home, maybe he was learning Spanish. So that's what he was doing with his time rather than looking yeah. at the press reports. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Sad people like you and I. No, sorry. <laughs> um, as you mentioned John Gregory, who managed to score an own goal. He, apparently he also, when you read the press report, he also, in the second half, the ball went dead and he pretended to head the ball into his own net, which he did. And then he mirrored it by doing it in the last minute. Not much use for us. But, um, <laughs> Didn't John Gregory... Uh, you know, I have vague recollection of him as a player, but clearly, yeah, he became a manager and quite a high-profile manager. Um, are there any other players that, in that Brighton team, and then we move on to Palace, but in that Brighton team, you've got Brian Horton, Mark Lawrenson, who we mentioned before, Steve Foster. Uh, exactly. Well, there's, and... there's the centre-back pairing of Foster and Lawrenson. You know, mm. not a, not you're not going to come away from that if you're the opposition's number nine. You know, if you're Clive Allen, you're going to come. Yeah. You're going to you could be in, nursing a few bruises by by the final whistle, most definitely. So they they were pretty formidable. Was Tony Grealish in the side? Sorry, I haven't got there. No, he wasn't. He wasn't. Uh, Neil McNabb, you know that Neil McNabb, yeah, midfield for, guy. Yeah, former but, Spurs yeah. Guy. yeah. Andy Ritchie, uh, Gary Stevens actually was in it as well. So I mean, they had quite two. The the player who scored their first goal actually is a guy called Peter O'Sullivan, not the racing commentator. Not the race, no. Um he interestingly in the and, and by the way, Nigel, for you, I've located this. Oh, look at that! Which is the program, wow. and I'll be sending. I'll be sending this to you. I oh, don't know if you've got kind. it. I haven't. But no, but but uh, seeing that picture, that picture yeah. is suddenly triggering. That's a familiar right. picture from you know. So wow. you've got Steve Foster with Steve Foster, his character as a headband, and Mark Lawrenson in the background. Yeah. And it looks like they're playing Wolves to me. Maybe Adam yeah, Gray so. is the yeah, player yeah. behind Foster. But Steve Foster is one of those ones that, I don't know why it is, you suddenly, as soon as you say Steve Foster, you see the headband, don't you? Because mm -hmm. it was inextricably linked to him. Uh, and as you say, doughty, solid centre-back. Unfortunately for my elder brother, his name was Stephen as well. Oh, so right. whenever Steve Foster was mentioned, he went, oh, this is really embarrassing. What the, sh the shame of it all, that <laughs> I have to have the same name as a Brighton player. Um, but he, yeah, they were very solid, as you say, those two. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's totally identifiable by, by the headband. Even now, if you yeah. said to a, a football fan of our sort of vintage, vintage mm -hmm. football headband, you know, did a word association game, Steve Foster would be the name. You know, in the, in the days, you know, if you were playing now, you would have copyrighted that as, you know, image protected it as a, you know, oh, yeah. as a trademark, you know, no one else could wear the headband unless, uh, you know, paid him some, some royalties or something. But um, yeah, no, really, really solid. Played for England, in fact, you know, went on, played for Luton yeah. afterwards as well, didn't he? Um, really solid player. Yeah, yeah, good. Good beard as well. Very fine beard. Yeah. Yes, yeah, he, he was well bearded. Um, <laughs> but Peter, in the, in the, the programme, Peter O'Sullivan is... They basically do the profile of Peter O'Sullivan. He was he'd been at Brighton for over ten years. Okay, so the weird thing about this, and and this is happening quite a lot when I'm going into this series and looking at players, at roughly this sort of era, that Peter O'Sullivan, it it told you in the program, had left the summer before to go and play for San Diego Soccer's, which is oh. probably the shittest name of a football team I can even think of. <laughs> but it was quite a regular thing. So when I was doing this with Darren Fletcher, who's uh, a Forest fan, and Darren Fletcher, the, the commentator, not the ex-Man United player, we his first game was Trevor Francis scoring a hatch against Man City. Trevor Francis, you know, the first million pound player, went to play in America in between seasons. I mean... Well, you you're, you're talking yeah. talking to a bit of an expert on this because oh, in my final good. year at primary school, we had right. to do a project and it was supposed to oh, do wow. a project on the local police force and everything. And this okay. is my only, only example of academic uh, descent. I didn't do that. I did my project on the North American Soccer League instead. Oh. And, and, and I thought my teacher wouldn't realise. It's really, really innocent. She said... <laughs> Where's your, where's your, where's your project on the police? It's due, and I was like, well, I've done this one instead. So I've written about the Seattle Sounders and the, 
Vancouver yeah. Whitecaps and everyone else. So I'm totally in with that. You know, with, with Francis' time at the Detroit Express, him and Alan Brazil up front for them. Yeah. I just find that a really fascinating time. And, you know, they say when you're young, you're kind of, you know, your, your mould is set. You know, I've written so much in middle age about the North American Soccer League and various <laughs> things. It's, it's clearly, it really, I found it unbelievably glamorous. I don't know yeah. why. I didn't like the razzmatazz, you know, all the cheerleaders and everything and players coming yeah. out one at a time. But the idea that they would play in trainers like I did on AstroTurf in yeah. sunshine, but you'd suddenly get players who would never play with each other in England, but were suddenly teammates. And I found that really fascinating in the way that I found and still find transfer talk fascinating because you're going, he could play next to so-and-so in this team. Suddenly yeah. it was almost like some sort of fantasy league where, you know, and they had some famous backers, you know, the Mick Jagger with money in Cosmos. Cosmos are owned by CBS, of course. Um, Rick Waitman put money in. Elton John yeah, put yeah. money into the LA Aztecs. Um, and it was almost... Where, like, where George Best was Where playing. George Best was yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he played for them and Fort Lauderdale and San Diego. I think he had three three or four spells out there. Yeah, you're right. Um, but they were just kind of creating their own team sort of thing. And, and they were earning what they were earning in two months over there is what they were earning, you know, in a season of mud-splattered pitch and cold and horribleness. Whereas if you're in California, you've got a, a little beachside property in Malibu and you're just kind of, you know, playing half-paced football on, a, yeah. on an AstroTurf pe- pitch in your trainers. And it's, you know, it wasn't high intensity at all. Um, but I find it's a fascinating time. Absolutely, yeah. So so all these ones who just migrated over there for a couple of months suddenly yeah, yeah. found themselves, you know, so you would have Palace and Brighton players possibly playing on the same side out there. Never. Um, so, so there's a book there, Nigel. Surely, have you, have you written? Oh, the books of the book's been written several times by other people, unfortunately. David Tossel's got oh. a very good book. Oh, yes, there's a, yes. There's a couple of others that, yeah, there's 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 no more story to tell, unfortunately. There's also the book on um, Gavin, what's his face? His, sorry, that's not his real name. Um, his book on <laughs> New York Cosmos as well, Once in a Lifetime, which then was the basis. Yeah. I'm not sure what came first, the documentary or the book. Um, okay. Possibly similar time, but um, one 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 begat the other certainly. Okay. Well, Peter O'Sullivan, going back to him. Sorry, yes. Right? yes so it, so no, 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 no. I, I, we like digression. This is what this, this podcast is all about: is good digression. <laughs> um, he, I didn't realise this until I read the profile in the in the program. He, he had actually started at Man United. He was signed by Busby oh, really? as a youth player, and he was you know alongside Best. Law and Charlton. He was at the club when they won the European Cup. He never made a first team appearance and ah, okay. obviously he realised he wasn't quite. And, and then he went to Brighton. And, and it, it's quite nice in the profile, they talk about his George Best image. So he had quite sort of, he had quite a lot of hair, let's face it. And, and he had a sort of Mexican moustache, as they called it. So right, yeah. Although he was uh, certainly, uh, he was Irish, but he didn't, they sort of pretended that he looked like a Mexican bandit, which I'm not quite sure I get. <laughs> but the best thing about this, you know, the Beatle haircut that they mentioned here, and also I found out he got married to a hairdresser from Shoreham, you see? So it all connects. These wow. footballers are thinking ahead. Oh, I've got to look like George Best. I've got to be a Beatle. I'll get married to a hairdresser. Uh, and off he went. <laughs> So there's, some, yeah. there's some good facial hair in that team, actually, because obviously Brian Horton had a, yes. a, a decent beard on him. I always thought Brian Horton, he just he just felt too old for that team, even though he probably yeah, wasn't. He was probably mean, about yeah, yeah. 27, 28. But he looked like my geography teacher. You know, he looked like he was someone, <laughs> you know, your parents' generation who was kind of sensible. And obviously that's why he's captain yeah. and then became a manager. Um, but he, he seemed old before his time, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. I just need to go back to what your teacher's reaction was to the fact that you were meant to be doing something completely different and you produced this project on the NASL. I was absolutely shitting it. I, don't, I wouldn't have got kicked out of primary blast. school because it was like no. the last two weeks of primary school. But by yeah. then, our secondary school had already been set and we're in two bands at secondary school. And I was going, God, am I going to be chucked into the bottom band for this? Oh, God. But also, also weirdly... I'm not a rebellious child at all, you know, pretty much right. the opposite. So where it came from that I did this, and also being fairly, oh, she won't notice. Well, I mean, 
I'm in a class of 20 kids and I was kind of, you know, <laughs> I was towards the top. She's going to notice if one of those ones towards yeah. the top aren't going to have done this or have done it on a completely different subject. But I seem to get away with it. I think it was just two months to go and, you know, nothing was ever said. It's quite a weird. They're going to catch up with me now. Maybe your teacher thought, ah, oh, we've got original thinker. He's moved off, you know, what we told him to do and this guy's going to make it because he's so creative. She was or... strict as nails. She was just oh. so hard okay. down the line. Oh, my God, yeah. She was... I've, I've met her son, actually, in, 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 in adulthood. He, he, went, oh, really? he went into magazines. And, and he go, I said, I remember your mum, but I didn't, I didn't let on. <laughs> she scared no. the life out of me. So this is it. She was extremely scary. It wasn't like she was a soft touch, and I thought, oh, no. I'll get away with it, a bit of boyish charm. She, you know, it was, it was, she was the hardest teacher I'd had all the way through primary school. So the thought, why would I do that? I don't know. Very weird. But here I am. Here I am, 45 years later, and then it still haven't taken me alive. <laughs> that's why you wrote something called the hard yards because you always like that <laughs> you know the tough <laughs> stuff don't exactly. you exactly yeah, yeah yeah um so yeah as i said looking at the context of this matter well actually sorry we need to just look at the palace team very briefly you see the thing that upsets me the most is that actually this this wasn't a bad team when you look at the lineup um we had paul hinchwood who became a club legend uh Nicknamed Doris, which could probably point to his um, qualities, but he was he was a very solid fullback. He was great. We had Peter Nicholas, who was oh, player, you know yeah. Welsh um, stalwart. Well, Jim to Cannon, Arsenal. yeah, yeah, yeah. Jim Cannon, who you know played two thousand five hundred fifty three games for Palace, <laughs> one club man. Um, Jerry Murphy, as you say, was a great player, yeah, really. lovely left foot. He literally. You know, they talk about the classic wand. He had a wand and he could just do stuff with it and always had his socks rolled down. He just had a lovely insouciance about him. He just drifted. Jerry Francis, you know, he was playing. Apparently a sweeper. Maybe that was the problem. We, we went slightly weird. Okay, playing yeah. Jerry Francis a sweeper. And as you pointed out, Clive Allen. Clive Allen, you know, up front. Mm. Didn't score. Um you just think, well, how does how is this club rooted to the bottom of the table? And, and when again, when you look at the program, it's got the league table, and it doesn't look particularly good for Palace because guess what? They're bottom after twenty three matches with twelve points. Now that's not great, is it? I mean, this was two points. This is still two points for a win, isn't it? Um, yeah, one five. Drawn two, lost sixteen. I mean, Ooh. that's not great, is it? And, For a team uh, that 12, 12 months earlier were being touted as the team exactly. that was going to define the on the oncoming decade. Uh, exactly, and it, it just yeah, it just appeared as I say within a week, uh, and then it all unraveled literally within a year. But it just slightly, it still triggers me that that actually should have been quite a decent team and it just didn't happen. And there, there are various comments in the Brighton Argus, which they weren't very um, respectful of our team. Um, he, this, is, this is what John Vinnicum, who's the guy who pointed it, he said, the wisdom of Bloy in re-engaging Malcolm Allison is strictly the concern of Palace fans and as may be expected, there was no shortage of pithy remarks flung in the direction of the northeast corner. Crammed in, there were a good 3,000 Palace devotees who made for a lively atmosphere, in inverted commas, and showed that they at least are hopeful of their team staying up. And didn't really happen. Um, there's also something really interesting in that particular press report, is which I've actually forgotten about. They had been talking about the possibility of Palace and Brighton sharing a ground at Gatwick. Now, wow. I, you know, I think there's a book about potential ground sharing because, you know, there were, the, there were a few and there were a few mergers, weren't there? Thames Valley Royals and all that sort of stuff and then the past with Robert Maxwell. I'm just trying to imagine how shit that would have been to <laughs> move to Gatwick, which, let's face it, if you're going to have an M23 derby, that's probably equidistant. But then playing your football 
in Gatwick every other week with your main rivals being there. What are you going to do with the face shit? Just take it down, put it up. Think, you know, it was that Sunderland Newcastle thing, wasn't yeah, there? The yeah. FA Cup earlier this season where the Sunderland chairman decided to redecorate the Sunderland bar with black and white in the way the lads. That guy really doesn't have a clue, does he? Anyway, yeah. we're not here to talk about Newcastle <laughs> stuff. But, but what's the Gatwick thing? Imagine what's the, the idea of coming together and being at the same ground at Gatwick. Yeah. I mean, was the was the Gatwick thing part of the British Caledonian thing with Brighton being sponsored? Well, yeah, I, think... I mean they were sponsored, weren't they? And it, yeah. there it is on the on the front, the seagulls with British Caledonian. The game. Because that that that, yeah. that to me, I always remember it being, you know, very much, you know, what they can now call, you know, a, a 360 deal. You know, it was it wasn't just yeah. saying Hitachi. Or Hafnia in the Everton's case. No, 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 so no, on no. There, it was much more, you know, and and obviously three years later we get the the British Caledonian helicopters taking them to Wembley, etc. Yeah. With you know an hour's worth of advertising on BBC as Alan Parry's on board, you know, and there's this British yeah, Caledonian yeah. branding everywhere, you know. Um, yeah, very subtle that wasn't it? Good product yeah. placement with Jimmy Beeler as their manager. Yeah, and yeah, then yeah. you have the BBC helicopter next to them, just with these shots of a British Caledonian helicopter going over North London. Very well done, yeah. But yeah, that, that seemed seemed whoever was at British Candoni was a bit more switched on than just here's a check and here's our logo, stick it on your shirt. Thank you very much yeah. for the tickets. It seemed much more, um, yeah, much more glued together. It's a, a bit more watertight yeah. as, as a sort of deal, as a sort of arrangement. I suppose the only thing you could say for the idea of both clubs moving to Gatwick is because we were just all both on the verge of going to Europe. Oh no, that doesn't work. Does it? Uh, Brighton obviously could do that now, but uh, we're a little, still a little way off Europe. Just, just, a, just little, a little. Just a little. Um, what a, next question for you, Nige, coming out of this match is, did you, this is your first game. You say your dad wasn't, that into football, so well he was. He was. He, he played at really high level. He, he had. Oh he, really? Okay. He was a trialist for Charlton, and he may have oh, gone right. into it just. He was in the last year of national service, so he got called up for that. Right. If he'd born a year later, he would have gone. And so yeah, he coached our, our football team, our kids' football team. Um, but yeah. yes, he was just. He had a slight appreciation of Spurs, but didn't have that. Didn't have that. Um, died in the wall. You know, inherited yeah. team. I haven't throughout my life, you know. I've, I'm I'm someone who's still unaffiliated, um, which is kind of everyone thinks is really weird. A man who's written makes a living out yeah. of writing about football. Um, yeah. I I kind of paint it that I was just trying to be the objective journalist back then. Obviously, when I was eight years old, um, okay. and my sons, neither of my sons are kind of you know are, are affiliated either. It's a weird. Most people, you know, inherit a team. Yeah, through our family, we inherit a non-team, you know, and just be the kind of floating voter. So I don't know. I, I I can't explain it. I can't explain why. You know, I grew up in the middle of nowhere. I'm still fairly close to Portsmouth, fairly close to Brighton. They could have been, either of those could have been my team, but mm -hmm. I don't know why. It just didn't happen. Well, it, well, you did mention that you had this sort of passing interest in Palace. So if I could just say, you need to stick with your original choice uh, and I'll see you at the next game at Selhurst Park. Well, the no, original... I'm not, I'm not going to put you through that. I'm obviously not. Well, it's it's kind of weird. I kind of you know, and I'm, when you know, I moved away, and then I was at university in Colchester, and then really got into them, watched them for a good few seasons. Yeah. Um, but then moved away, moved away to the other side of the country. So you know, um, I don't know. Well, you're in the hot hotbed of football now, aren't you? You're in Somerset. So oh, the, the absolute hotbed. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, um, Yeovil Town really ripping it up. As it yeah, well, Yo, yeah. I mean, we got uh, the Bristol clubs are closer to me. Um, Cleveland Town is kind of you know where my latest kind of flirtation goes. Oh, um, okay. So uh, yeah, they're, they're they're riding high in the uh, in the Western League Premier at the moment. It's all station Western League Premier. Ah, oh, yes. So, yeah. Well, I I. Um, my sins, my non-league team is Hendon, and they, oh. they're in this weird league where they have to pay bloody Western Super Mare and loads of teams in the South West, which doesn't seem right at that level. But National um, League South, that'll be, yeah. National oh, no, I think it's below that one. It's below that one. It's, oh, the, it's West, yeah. what used to be called the Isthmian. I don't, I don't, okay. They changed the name. So the Hellenic, sure. yeah. Yeah, Western are now in the... Something uh, like that. I'm, I'm yeah. not going to bore you with the team. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's, it's great because I take the dog with me. Um, okay. Tea is, tea is a quid. You know, yeah. And, you know, what more do you want? You know, it's good. Well, and, and you get those good. and that spiciness between the two the two dugouts. You know, you know it's, it's all there. 
It's all great. Um, and now, just we're just I'm just going to touch back on the rivalry thing because I think it's quite important because this is the context of the the match you went to. I've just dug out actually the quote from John Vinicum, the the old guy, about Gatwick. Surely the sharing of the stadium, however, fine in the nomad land of Gatwick would surely destroy vital grassroots. Well, you're absolutely right, John Vinicum. Uh, I don't think sharing ground is a great idea. Apparently, and they talk about the team becoming, in the Brighton programme, they say, ah, we are now our newly traditional rivals. So it was in that, you know, the first yeah, yeah, it's only a few uh, years, I mean, it's yeah, years, something since like the FA Cup Mullery uh, incident in sort of '75. But it was apparently it was our twenty foot palace's twenty first post war visit to Goldstone. So that's that's a regular meeting, isn't it? I mean, that's mm. out of thirty four years, you're going down there twenty one times. So that is part of the reason because we used to match them and got quite often got promoted and relegated at the same time. Yeah, probably. yeah. So that was that. Um, but going back to this idea of not having a club affiliated with the club. So that was your first match. You then got intoxicated, five goals, fantastic. A little bit of, you know, pretty good atmosphere, you know, at Christmas, post-Boxing Day. Did you have a gap between your, that and your next game? Did you manage to get into, you know, going into a regular... You see, that's the thing about not having a club that you're affiliated with or, you know, you get pushed upon you or thrust upon you. Was there, you know, then, oh, I'll, I'll do it again in three, four, five months' time and go somewhere else? Oh, or... it was it was, it was was instant. Oh, no, it was four years right. later when I next went to a game. It's the bizarre oh, yeah, thing. Four years. Yeah, four years later. So, um and for always like I went the opposite direction from home. Rather than Brighton, we went to Portsmouth again. My dad got tickets. Right. Um, possibly even more of a spicy local derby because it was Portsmouth, Southampton in the Cup, 1984, yeah. January 1984. They hadn't played in the way that Palace and Brighton all played each other. Portsmouth yeah. and Brighton hadn't played each other for a long time because they've been in, in other divisions. Um, extremely spicy. I do remember that. Maybe I was, I was yeah. older by then, so I was 15 by then, so I could... I would appreciate what was going on a bit more around, yeah. around me a bit more. Um, but yeah, you know, pitch battles down Fratton High Street. We were standing mm. on the on the North Terrace, absolutely packed in. Never had an experience like that. That first game, I was sitting in the sitting and sitting down in the stands, and just you know, I remember standing next to my dad, and then suddenly he'd be like six people across from me because it was just this kind of you know jelly like amorphous kind of blob mm -hmm. that was just constantly moving you're constantly trying to keep your feet on the terrace yeah dangerous as hell really dangerous as yeah, hell. yeah yeah um mark dennis got coined just just along from us so this guy probably about 10 10 people along right. got him it was such a toxic atmosphere and i remember hearing a guy behind me going these are the kinds of shits who who score in the last minute and indeed oh. ball goes over to the far post 89th minute steve moran taps in and if it was cool. a powder keg, that was the point at which it exploded. So uh, uh, I think, I don't, th again, I think we possibly drove again to avoid the train station, um, mm -hmm. to avoid Fratton station, um, but still getting back to wherever we parked the car. I remember it was a, it was going a long route of down, down alleys, down back streets, avoiding the kind of high street in order to get to our car. Had we met some trouble in a narrow alley, it would have been even worse. But um, yeah, yes, it was. Uh, it was. Uh, I do remember. That. I remember that one more clearly. Obviously, a bit older and not so long ago. Mm -hmm. But um, yes, what? Why he took me to two two local derbies as my first two games? I don't know. You know, we could have had something a little more genteel. But it was good. It was good. And we had Alan Biley playing for Portsmouth, who who yes, could have yeah. won it in the last few minutes blazed it over from about seven eight yards out and that would have that would have just sent them sent uh that that, that the fratten end as well you know that would have sent yeah. them crazy um he had luxuriant hair as well he had he fantastic hair. he had a oh, big a mop of blonde big, hair big big yeah. peroxide oh it's, it's like a like Perfect. a rooster everyone everyone <laughs> says it's like what's good far more like a rooster i thought but yeah great player yeah. really another another great player who you know like the jerry murphys and like the michael robinsons who 
he had no international career. He might have played a B cap for England, possibly. Mm. Um, but really good players who just didn't didn't kind of break through. Because in, in those days, you know, to break through internationally, England would have really settled side. You know, you would have a fairly standard lineup, and the squad yeah. would be a certain number of people who, you know, handed out like smart smarties these days. You know, let's let's blood them, let's get them in. So yeah. a lot more players come out with a cap, at least one cap, than, than they did back then. And it's a lot of people, you know, the likes of Alan Sunderland and people like that, you know, really good, good, solid strikers, scored lots of goals. Clive Allen, yeah. you know, didn't do it internationally. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, so lots of lots of good players to kind of look back on. Yeah, yeah, and Bailey was, yeah, looked, looked fantastic. The cockerel, of course. And we, we call him the cockerel now, there we are. <laughs> so, I must say, the idea of queening Mark Dennis, I don't think it's a great... Oh. It's not a great choice because he's the sort of guy who would pick up the coins and then return them to you. Uh, with yeah, a bit of frosty. with a, with a, with a bit, you know, and you know because he played as a fullback, so he's right on the edge. He's close to the touchline. He's he's used to getting it anyway. You know the verbals, yeah. and and so he was a pantomime villain. Steve Williams was also in the side. Another mm -hmm. hard as nails pantomime villain who I later saw play when I used to go to go and watch Colchester. He's playing for Exeter City then. All right. Uh, this is this is a rare moment of uh, of me being able to predict something in football. And I said to my mate, I said, Steve Williams gets a red card. Ten minutes gone, yellow card. Twenty minutes gone, second yellow. That's just yeah. Fantastic. But he was, he was he was he was he was he was he was trouble. He was trouble on yeah. the pitch. Good enforcer. One one you yes. like on your pitch, you know, Roy Keane type. You like him on your side, but you would hate him. Hate him yeah. to be lining up against you. Yeah, there's plenty of those out there, aren't there? Um so going back, it does seem quite weird that your dad would take you to two really intense rivalries, but maybe you just thought, right, I'm going to throw him at the deep end, see how it gets on. And, well, yeah, you know. I, I guess it was something like that, or, or just these these games kind of percolated. And I think the first thing was because I mentioned Palace, and therefore this is yeah. the closest they're going to be playing to our house. And he yeah, yeah. was unaware that rivalry, as we say, was was still in its fairly embryonic stages. You know, mm. I'm not sure it's even called the M23 derby back then at all no, um, but so. Portsmouth Southampton you know well that was a big game he would have seen it more as a big game as opposed to necessarily a dangerous game um, yes. you know um, and, and, and I don't know how but he managed to get tickets despite you know not having any I don't know how he able to get it you know because every Portsmouth every Southampton fan would have snapped up those tickets like oh, so he, he did well there he did well there yeah well well done well done your dad um, then so that's a four-year gap. That's quite an interesting gap. And, and as you say, you were pretty obsessed by it. You were, you know, even doing your primary school essays about football. Um, did you feel that oh, this was too long? Are you were you battering your dad? Can we go? Or do you just went okay? Well, that's that's a bit of a one-off, and I'll wait for four years. I don't know. I should have been. I mean, looking back now, it's like why wasn't I? I was playing. I was playing Saturday. I was doing train football training Saturday mornings. And playing yeah. on Sunday mornings, so there was that, and he was the manager, so that was taking up part of his weekend. But yeah. I, I still don't think I I did badger. You know, I was really jealous. The school we used to do, school was quite football oriented, um, and it was a, an all boys comp, so sport was was right. thought of highly. Um, and so there'd be lots of trips to Wembley to go and watch England uh -huh. play, which my parents never let me go on. You know, the thought of being out, you know, after dark. And being up in yes. that London, um, Ooh, so yeah. the, the the ones I was very jealous of always got them to get me programmes, whether it's England Bulgaria or England Brazil. I seem to remember them going to see as well. So right. really jealous of that. But I was just really into playing as well, though just just playing in my driveway, you know, kicking the ball against the garage door. That's what I would just do at that sort of age, you know, until mm -hmm. until music came along. I mean, and to be fair, by by eighty two, eighty three, music was really kind of fighting for my Take attention. Um, yeah. And I was kind of, I was fairly precocious on the music. If I wasn't on the football, and only having, only having been to one match at that point, music, you know, record, obsessive record buying at the age of 12, you know, really kind of slightly grown up and stuff as well, you know, that I'd really yeah. pretentiously read in the face, I would buy the face at the age of 12, not understand Ooh. what it meant. You know, I was, <laughs> I was, I was very pretentious and precocious in that way. So, yeah, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe. Yeah, I think, I think music got in the way certainly of football, but it's football's always been there, but just not, not to the extent that it was when I was, you know, absolutely obsessed, 10, 11 year old. I was, I mean, music and football are linked very closely, and you know, 
lots of musicians love football, lots of football, love it. and and there are you, there are endless links. But I think, and I'm very passionate about music as well. But the thing about music is, you can pretty much guarantee what you're going to get. I mean, okay, you might get disappointed by a particular album or whatever it might be or but when you go to a gig you know what you're going to get you, you like the band so therefore there isn't that element of jeopardy where you go mm. oh this could turn out really badly like we could get beaten 3-2 by Brighton on the 27th of December 1980 and feel really <laughs> bloody miserable about it but going to a gig okay so you might have the odd disappointing one but to relate your first gig to your first football match, you know, and the, the, all the subsequent concerts you go to, they're pretty much, you expect, you get what you expect, don't you? And yeah, you, you're going to be pretty, you're going to be satisfied, uh, and maybe even elated, but you don't get that sense of this could go either way and it probably will go badly. So that, I've, I've always had that as a thing, yeah. between the, the, the two. Do, do you feel that's true as well? Yeah, I think I think the first gig, first match thing, I think those are equitable because suddenly, you know, my first gig, Portsmouth Guildhall, so you're suddenly amongst 2,000 people and you've never done yeah. that before. You never stood among 2,000 people. And Brighton that day was 27,000, so that was the biggest yeah. crowd of the season. So those, I remember sitting in the South Stand looking across to the yeah. East Terrace, the open East Terrace, and just going, what? And trying to work out, okay, if there's 27,000 in there, there must be... Yeah. It's got to be the best part of 10,000 on terrace because it was, you know, it was pretty high terrace, really densely packed. And yeah. you know, so that's what 10,000 people look like, you know. Um, exactly, yeah. And, and, and yeah, because these, these things that you've only seen on, on screen before are suddenly you've seen them in the flesh, you know. And so whether it's a gig, whether it's a football match, going, okay, this is actually happening in front of me, you know, and that whole thing. And I remember, I remember at the football, um, and I had this feeling the other night as well that a goal goes in and I'm so programmed because I've learned about sport just from television waiting yeah. going okay I'm waiting for the replay I want to see that goal again <laughs> and that notion you know really really naive notion at 12 I found myself doing it at Clevedon Town 10 days ago where the third goal went in big goal yeah. was scrambled keep my three saves came out and a play just came in smashed the top corner I go right I want to see that and I've still got that thing of my body is yeah. expecting to be able to see that Again, and from a different angle and slow mo, and really and see it and, and connect with it. Um, but I think you're absolutely right with the gigs. The gigs they become a ritual, and as you say, the element of surprise is that it's not there. The element of jeopardy, and and if it were, it's because the gig has gone badly, because everyone expects, yes. okay, what well, is band going to come out? They know how to play their songs. Yeah, yeah, everyone loves them in this room, and therefore that's what's going to happen, and we know it's going to happen. Um, so the element of surprise will only be a negative thing. It'll only be, you know, someone gets electrocuted or the fire alarm yeah. goes off or, or, you know, or the, the band have a scrap on stage because of the musical differences or whatever, which has been known. Um, yes. But absolutely, you know, they, you know, I go to non-league and I've, since I wrote my non-league book, The Bottom Corner, mm. you will never have a boring non-league game because you are right there next to it. It's so visceral. You still, you'll, you'll feel a crunching challenge. Even if it's nil-nil, even if the, no one has had a shot on target, there is still so much there to really absorb, you know, the crunch of the tackle. It is so visceral. You're right there. You can, you can smell the deep heat on the player's legs. You can reach out and touch them if you wanted to, you know. Um, you know, you don't need to coin them. If you want to <laughs> give, give an opposition <laughs> player a bit of jeopardy, you can physically do that. Um, and so... And I think Danny Baker said the same again, you know, who gets bored with it all nil? There's still 90 minutes of action, 90 minutes of a that player against that player, or that decision went wrong. And why just you know, there's you know, no one no one yaw should yawn through a football match because as you say, no. anything could happen that very next minute. Really good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and talking of non-league football, um, I think this is a good moment to have a, a quick chat with you about one of your first visits to Wembley, maybe not your actual first, but for a club match, I assume it was. So talk to us about Colchester Witten Albion, which some of our audience might not remember that well. Weird, weirdly, yeah. It's not in, in know, it's strange, I it? Oh, it was actually my first visit to Wembley, I have to say, yeah. It was uh, oh, okay. 1992, May 1992. Um, 
I'd been, so this was my fourth year of university. I'd spent the third year out in Minneapolis on an exchange program. So mm -hmm. in the fourth year, um, I really got into watching the U's at that point. Um, yeah. Sorry, Colchester, let's Colchester, just put yeah, that yeah, in yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, would be, uh, and, and it just felt like it's, you know, I knew I was only going to be there for another year. And that season really, really got to know the players, went to every home game, quite a few away games. Mm -hmm. And and that team was a pretty settled lineup. You know, there would be thirteen players that the the the, the that day's eleven would be picked from. So you yeah, knew yeah. you knew great players like Nicky Smith, who kind of played left wing half, and, and Roy McDonough, red card Roy was was oh, player yes. manager, player it's a bit of a chairman's son in law, penalty taker would always pick himself number nine because he was desperate for a hundred league goals. So he was, okay. he was he was getting on a bit then. He was very very much grey. Um, so he was he was great pantomime villain to have on your side, um, mm. and and every game we seemed to win every home game. So we we're in a GM Voxel conference at the time. You seemed yeah. to every win every home game four nil, um, with yeah, Mark Kinsella good. scoring the fourth from about thirty yards mm. top corner. Fantastic! It, it seemed to go that way. So uh, finished level on points with Martin O'Neill's Wickham, won the title. Yeah. Then, right. then off to, to Wembley the following Saturday, Witten Albion, to do the double, the non-league double in the uh, uh, trophy. Martin O'Neill is the guest of Sky Sports up in the studio, giving it a bit of... Not not being too pleasant about uh, Colchester, shall we say? Because uh, he's was he was he harbouring a grudge? Because he, he was harbouring a grudge because his Wickham yeah. his Wickham side had lost on goal difference. So those those four nil wins kind of really, really, okay. really made it for us. Um, so yeah, so three one win for Colchester in the end. Um, yeah, two goals up early on. Uh, Mike Masters quiz quiz question here. First American to score at Wembley was Mike Masters, Colchester United. Yes. Number two. Went on to become yeah. an investment banker. Um, and Nicky Smith, my favourite player, Nicky Smith on the left hand side, he got one as well. Yeah. Then Jason Cook, second half, Jason Cook gets sent off for one of the. I don't know how many have been. Not that many people have been sent off at Wembley at that point. You know, he was. Something like a fourth ever or something like that. It was something okay. really, really low. He gets sent off. Witten Albion get one back. We go, mm. it's here's that sense of jeopardy that we all love. Yeah. <laughs> we don't like it too much when it's you know. And yeah. uh and then and then the ball played through to Steve McGavin, who was the star player, went on to play for Birmingham, Wickham as well. Great mm -hmm. player, Ipswich Town trainee originally. Just a great play coming in off the wing, couple of step overs, and then put it into the far corner. I was right down the line of it as well, so you just see it going in, and that was it. Three one, did the double, and I'd, I'd done I'd done all the things pre match as well. The players coming, walking back towards the old tunnel at Wembley, and sticking my right. program through. Even I was a grown man by then, sticking my program and a pen <laughs> through the wire fence for Scott yeah. Barrett, the keeper, to sign, and and uh, and Steve McGavin signed, and everything. And in fact. In fact, they made such an impression on me. In my, in my younger days as, as journalist, when I was a magazine editor, mm -hmm. when I worked for a magazine that had very little budget and so you'd end up having to write most of the features, but you couldn't have the same name as a byline, so you'd have to create a number of pseudonyms. <laughs> uh, Scott McGavin was was my, my byline for years and years and years. Any old duff feature that I wasn't particularly proud of. Uh, so I was named after Scott Barrett, their keeper, and and Steve McGavin, their mercurial right. star centre okay. forward. So uh, they they made an impression, and that was that was really nice because that was the final year at university, and you know, and it was just a really nice encapsulated season. Really, really got to know the players. Some of the players lived in the same village; they'd be on the same bus as me when I was going onto right. the campus, um, and to do the non-league double, yeah, really nice. And I, I got the sense of. Get what why supporting one team and feeling those glory days was particularly is so important to people, which I hadn't mm. really kind of never kind of understood or or felt myself personally before. Yeah, because it was the FA Trophy final. The FA it? Trophy um, final, yeah. And that not many teams have done the non-league double, from what I can remember. I think there are about four, are there? Yes, it's together? not. It's it's not. It's not many because you know the trophy does go down to sort of three tiers of the yeah. of the pyramid. And so those ones at the bottom, they're all they, you know, they're still way off, you know, yeah, becoming part of the same in ninety two. So that is yeah. that is this is going to be one of the highlights of that, that team's career. So you know the likes of Tiverton Town and play people like that would really give it give it a good go in Taunton Town. And stuff. Yeah. And then so I'm assuming Colchester was still at Lair Road when you were there. Oh, so, magnificent Lair Road, yeah. 
I, I did actually speak to someone about Lair Road and his first game was Colchester Plymouth in the playoff semi final, which is again a pretty interesting start to his um, football career. Well, I've got as to know a, Steve Lamac. I've got to know Steve Lamac over there. Oh yeah, the of museums. Course, yeah, yeah. And we it turns out we used to watch Colchester on the same spot of the terrace. And uh, I once got oh. told by Red Card Roy to fuck off. Excuse my language. <laughs> right. uh, no, during no, no, a match, no. during a match, because we were giving him back. He's, Rather than take off himself, he took off the other striker because he was desperate, desperate for these hundred goals. Yeah. And, so he's doing a jet and he just turned around and he just goes, why don't you just fuck off? Anyway, so I'm talking to Lamac years later about coach. I said, oh, Roy McDonald told me to fuck off. He goes, well, he told me to fuck off once. <laughs> we tried to work out whether it was the same day. <laughs> and on any fact that we were stood next to each other. But no, it was a separate occasion. Steve can remember the exact match. And, oh, uh, gosh. Okay. And annoyingly, so... annoyingly, after he told me to where to go, um, he scored this, you'd call it a worldie, I'd call it a hit and hope. Ball came in across the edge of the area, he's on the edge of the area and just kind of scoops up and it went to the far corner and in. And he just came over us, flicking the bees at us, going, yeah, go on then. <laughs> Who knows more about football? Go, all right, okay. Fair enough, all right, okay. Well, I've got two questions. One, did he get his 100th goal? Oh, God, I should have looked this up. I'm not sure he did. He may oh. have done. There's your jeopardy. Uh, There's and your secondly... Jeopardy, yeah. I need to get Steve Lamac on this programme because I'm sure he'd love to talk about his first He game, would completely has to be love. at Lair Road. It will it? be at Lair I just love Lair Road. It was falling apart at the seams. Mm. Real, you know, not not a great ground, not, probably not a very safe ground either, I have to say. But yeah. but the atmosphere, the tightness of, you know, which Leeds found out in, you know, back in 71, you yeah, know, yeah. just you could get really tight, good atmosphere in it, you know, a little bit. A little bit like Kenilworth Road, you know, certainly on the main stand side. I had that that kind of feel yeah, that yeah. it was all, you know, we didn't have a load of bungalows on the other side of the pitch, but, you know, like... like no, no, no. Did. But, um, certainly um, a, a lot of corrugated iron, which is always a, lot of, a, yeah. a good sign, isn't it? Having corrugated yeah. iron. Cor- corrugated iron, crumbling concrete terrace behind the goal. Yeah, that's always, always yeah. good. With a bit of crack, yeah. you think, could this divide and we all get swallowed up by <laughs> if there was a minor, <laughs> a minor bit of seismic activity in the area? Um, yeah. But yeah, I'd, you know, and fond memories, you know, I, I was I'd, I stayed in culture for a few months and was on the dole there, so I, I was still getting games with my UB40, so I'd still go and see them yeah. back in league action by then, you know, for three quid, and you know, I walked to the ground because I had a little else to do in those, in those days. So uh, yeah, I, I, I was like like going to the ground as well. The bus where I lived would take me all the way to the ground, but I'd get off in the town centre okay. just to do that walk past, past the garrison and then up, up onto yeah, the yeah. road and just, just and you, you, you'd be, everyone would be coming out of adjacent streets and you'd suddenly, you know, a mass, you know, as much as a 3,000 strong a crowd of masses. But, uh, but it felt good. It felt like a proper Saturday ritual and that, the kind of thing that mm. as an 11, 12 year old, I didn't actively pursue for some reason, then, no. you know, I, had I had I grown up in a town with a football team, I would have done, you know, definitely. It was sure. just it's just yeah. logistics and trains and buses, and I lived in the sticks, and the last bus would be probably five o'clock on a Saturday. And how the hell do you walk the eight miles then? You know, in the dark yeah, yeah, with no pavements. Yeah. You know, it's all that sort of thing. So, yeah, yeah. But I like I also like the idea of the contrast between being a regular at Lair Road and then suddenly going to Wembley. So that to you must have said, seemed. Not just at golf, it just must be feel like the other end of the world in terms of. So, I mean, okay, that was the old Wembley, so it wasn't exactly a great stadium, but it was no. a bloody big stadium. Oh, yeah, it must you have know. been incredibly impressive for you. How many would have been at that final one, <sighs> Nigel? I don't know, maybe 20,000, 20, I'd say, yeah, something like that. I mean, certainly far more, but suddenly became Colchester United fans who hadn't been there all season. Um, you know, Seriously. we got the coach up from, from the village we were living in. So I courted my wife. I courted my wife on the terraces of Lair Road. You know, she used to feign an interest and come along. So I thought, okay, maybe, maybe she's interested in me because she keeps coming to, to watch all this, uh, you know, stand among the scroats on the terrace behind the goal. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I, I remember my first opinion was, was it like, you know, it would all be told about Wembley Way. I thought, oh, this is the yeah. Way. But you come by coach and you just go around this series of really shoddy little lockups mm. and garages and tire yeah. merchants and little mini roundabouts. If you're a team, you know, an international team, say, you know, you're Argentina, <laughs> yeah. the world champions Argentina, you'd come for a friendly, yeah. you know, Wembley. Yeah. And you should go, this is it? You know, because he, he just like, I thought the coach had taken the wrong turn. I thought I'd really got on the wrong <laughs> bus or something. But yes, it's such an inauspicious entrance. It was oh, it's, then. 
sort of still it's got that you know sort of new sort of shopping mall type thing and the yeah, yeah. box, box parks and all that but generally the surrounding area you know when you're walking from north wembley you, you literally past you know your littles your uh, it just feels like this is just a shoddy pretty ordinary town or you know part of london so, and then suddenly you turn in and, and there is now clearly the arch and it suddenly transforms into a football stadium yeah. for you but as you say there's not a great build up it's not like walking you know let's say the olympic stadium at rome is quite impressive because you just walk there's a big long walkway to it and rome itself is a little bit prettier than wembley i'm, I'm sorry i'm throwing it out there <laughs> sorry sorry any wembley fans oh, I don't know, you know, it's such a let's call job. it that <laughs> I know, I know, but at least Wembley doesn't have a statue to Mussolini. Anyway, we're not going to go into that. Um, <laughs> so then we talk about, you know, the contrast between Lair Road and Wembley, but I'd also like to touch on your first international match because although Colchester with Albion is a huge game, it's not an international match. Not, so, no. so just touch on your first... Um, so first international match would have been actually going to see Wales, um, Cardiff okay. Arms Park against Belgium, I'm not sure of the year. I think right. it's early 90s. So I seem to remember, um, I took my, my my nephew came along when he was very young. He lives in Swansea. Um, and yes, yeah, so I thought, I seem to, I should have looked, sorry, I apologise, I should have looked this up beforehand. But no, I'm, no, no, no. I'm, I'm thinking a 3-0 win to Wales, okay. but I find wow. that highly unlikely. I'm, yeah. I'm seeing a Gary Speed header from a corner. Okay. Right. That's more likely, but I uh, sorry, I should have looked this up. But um, no, 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 was that was the the you know, and that was the different dynamic from having twenty thousand Colchester fans at Wembley, mm -hmm. where you know there was no national anthem for Colchester, you know, no. and so you know, so hearing the Welsh national anthem, I'm you know, my yeah. wife, your then girlfriend, now wife is Welsh, um, so that kind of tied me in a bit more, you know, and and. You know, in the arms part, I used to love the arms. And as great as the Millennium Stadium is, the arms part was great too. And really, yeah. really. Um, and so when they started playing playing footy there, as, as opposed to at the race course um, ground. Or um, Ninian Road, they played Or, or Ninian Park, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Welsh yeah. internationals, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so the, for the big games. And that's when, I'd say in the, in the 90s, despite the players they had in the 80s, despite the fact they had Rush and they had Hughes, in the mm. 90s is when Wales seemed to appreciate its football heritage a bit more. I mean, whether it's in direct proportion to the Welsh rugby team yeah. going on a bit of a trough and, and football coming through a lot more um, is, is a thing, you know, and starting to play those at the National Stadium, you know. But even now, you know, they still only play home, and, home internationals at the Cardiff City Stadium, effectively what was Ninian Park, as opposed yeah. to the Millennium, I still call it the Millennium Stadium, but uh, um, the Principality. Um, but yes, I, the, the, but the notion of this national thing where pretty much everyone is rooting for that same team as opposed yeah. to, you know, yeah, yeah. you know, not being half and half, but being having having a, a discernible away support to a vociferous, whether it's Palace in 1980, whether it's Witten Albion, who, uh, you know, would have brought a few less to Wembley that day and probably been yeah. about 100, 100 yards away from us as well. Yeah. Um, but that was, the, that was the, the first international. And then I went back to Cardiff for my son's first game, in fact. And that was that was oh, another okay. Wales international. Um, it would be 2014, possibly. Um, is Scotland actually a bit later than that? No, it would been about the right time. He would have been about eight or nine then. Um, Wales, Scotland, World Cup qualifier. Okay. Um, and this is one I'm just trying to get my son into. But he's, he's into it and he's starting to you know, have a kick around and stuff. Um, and this is this is the height of Gareth Bale in his pomp at Spurs, and and sure. the start of him being the real kind of national figurehead for the national team. Yeah. And Scotland are one 0 up, and then towards the end of the game, he wins a penalty. Um, some people say he clicked his own heels. Some some of my mm. Scottish friends say that. Um, I, right. wouldn't, I wouldn't say so at all. Um, scores the penalty, and then right in front of us. I mean, I'll, I'll set the scene because I've taken him to his football match thinking, right, this is me trying to get into football. We parked yeah. in the car park, the city of Cardiff Stadium. It is literally 40 yards between our car and the turnstile. Right. 
Wow. It was a monsoon, an absolute deluge. In that time, right. I'd never been so wet in such a short period of time. It was ridiculous, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Michael Robinson could score two goals in that 40 seconds. We got absolutely drowned rats in those four seconds. So we walk in and he's just looking so bedraggled and going, oh, this isn't going well because I'm cold. So he's like, <laughs> chips, can of Coke, chocolate bar. Right. Now, plonk yeah. you here. This is better. That, we, are, we were down in the corner. Quite a good view. Um, probably about a dozen rows up. So he's looking good. And then Gareth Bale, you know, an hour later, scores the best goal I've ever seen live in the flesh. He just gets... Just receives a free kick, close to the halfway line, just moves forward. Scotland uh, are very slow at getting towards him. And he just unleashes unleashes this shot that just flies into the absolute far top corner. And then he comes and slides on his chest in front of us, in, you know, on this wet, muddy pitch right in front yeah, of yeah. us. And and in the, in the same way as, you know, seeing nine goals in your first game, you know, you're going to fall in love with that. At yeah. that point, my son was like, Oh well, yeah, this is all right. This because his idol was then suddenly <laughs> Gareth Bale. He started having yeah. an affinity for Spurs, similar to my affinity to Palace at a similar age, and, yeah. and that was that was just a fantastic. So we were absolutely bedraggled. You know, story to tell, but but also the glory of this amazing goal, and just yeah, I've not seen a better goal since then. And you had to explain to your wife it was worth getting pneumonia. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 No, yeah. that that spell we both spent in hospital for several weeks. <laughs> <laughs> um, brilliant. Okay. Well, I think you know we've we spun uh, a, quite a web here from you know the Goldstone Ground through to Leia Road, through to Wembley, back to Cardiff Arms Park, and you know I think all those experiences do fit in really nicely, and it's it's part of being a football fan and you know a football writer like we are is that you get these. The beauty is it's just very different depending on Absolutely. era, depending on club, depending on ground, depending on... So there's nothing predictable. Um, I mean, there are things predictable. Palace are going to concede more last-minute goals than any other club this season. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but is there one thing that sticks in your mind? Actually, there's one other question I had. Is your first memory of a cup final and your first memory of a World Cup, which aren't necessarily ones you went to. They're no. probably received through television. You know, so many people of sort of roughly our generation, their first intake of the football drug is through television. Yeah, and then, yeah. You know, reading magazines, reading papers, you know, getting it all, uh, not via the internet as it is now, which is, is it's got its place, but, you know, it's slightly different. Those first FA Cup, that first FA Cup final, the first World Cup you can remember. Can you just yeah, yeah. touch on those? Absolutely. I mean, this is probably the first football match I felt aware of was 76, Southampton Man United. Um, growing up on the South Coast, obviously it was all over the local press for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks beforehand. Um, and the fact that Bobby Stokes scored the winning goal, his mm -hmm. niece sat behind me in primary school. So oh. it was, you know, yeah, so it was like, could he have any more direct connections to this thing called football? And it was at that point, and 76, 77 is the first season, well, I started buying Shoot Magazine every week, and that was it. That was that was the first, uh, totally that game, and then I was into football. Before then, I can't remember anything about football, even though my dad played still on Saturdays at that point. Yeah. Um, and I would have gone to see him play, but don't really have any memories. But that was that game, and suddenly because it was so vivid and it was – all over the local press for weeks after as well. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. The guy who scored the winning goal is the uncle of the girl who sits behind me in, in, in class. Um, but couldn't she have backed you up with your um, project? So Bobby Stokes and he surely should have backed you up with your teacher and say, oh, well, that's a really good thing to look at, the NA. Yeah, I don't think yeah. that happened. No, it didn't Let happen. I, th I think he did actually go stateside as well. I think I think he had a season oh, or two. Yeah, so it would have tied not. in. It would have tied in. Yeah. That's who should have been my first ever yeah. interviewee. Clearly, come on. Oh, yeah. Anyway, okay. sorry. Um, but uh, yeah, and so, also, so, I, so, I will. I will point out. Sorry to do this, but that 1976. Do you know who Southampton beat in the semi-final at Stamford Bridge? Palace, yeah, Crystal Palace. And we were third division side. Southampton was second division second, side. Wow. And, and with, that was the Allison, famous Allison. You know. Red and blue sash coming in, and um, just after that, we beat Leeds, Chelsea, and Sunderland away, all away as a third division side. And then Southampton robbed us 
uh, two nil at Stamford Bridge. Anyway, I'm not going to get into Rob's that. Rob's two nil. Was that two dodgy goals then? Yeah, 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 yeah. We had That's fifteen the... disallowed. <laughs> but this is it. You know, you 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 beat the big guns and then lose to the the one yeah. who's the easiest appointment and the ho- uh, opponent in the whole cup run. That's about, yeah. Yeah, as as uh, a guy I know very well who runs a podcast called Five Year Plan Palace Podcast. Typical Palace is his favourite phrase, and he uses it almost <laughs> every other sentence. Um, but so that was your your first one. So yeah, Southampton, bit of a turn up for the books beating Man United in that. Your first World Cup. What was what was that? So that will be seventy eight. So that's seventy eight. Okay. You know, and that was the time where it looked hopelessly exotic. You know, because the pictures oh. were grainy. It sounded like the commentators were were just commentating through a phone line so they sounded so <laughs> different they could have, they could have been on another planet and this could have been taken by, you know it was so different you know so obviously you know the cliches the ticker tape in Argentina and everything yeah. um, and despite the fact that England weren't in it mm. possibly because they weren't in it I paid real attention to other teams you know so I, yeah um, and then that was my first sticker album as well was World Cup 78 you know and that's that's the thing that really cemented cemented my love affair I think I mean, it's just, it's so exotic. You know, I will watch it now yeah. and it's just, it's just, oh, it's just great, it you know. Yeah. I mean, I remember all those, all those long range Dutch goals, the Ari Hahn goals from the yeah, halfway yeah, line yeah. and those are just imprinted. Kempers 1-0, you know, yeah. all of that, it's it, it's there. And that's, that's when I first became aware of kind of international football properly, I think, mm. you know, other sure. than England have failed to qualify. Okay. Okay. Am I going to? But Scott, but Scotland were down seventy eight. So we, you know, there was, there was a bit of kind of you know, semi local interest. Um, yeah. But, but a bit exotic, you know, Teofilo Cabigas, you know, oh, all yeah. these, all these fantastic Leopoldo Luque, you know, these fantastic Brazilians, all the Brazilians, you know, it's it's yeah. So that 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 really cemented me because it was it's so flavoursome in, in the way that probably the seventy Mexico seventy works for people as well. In that yeah. these 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 are. These could be pictures beamed in from another galaxy, you know, and the, exactly. a voice that sounds so distant, even though it's only half a world away. But um, yeah, and a, and a world away from the muddy pictures and postponements and frozen frozen turf of, of, of what we were used to kind of all year you know, through the winters at that point. Yeah, exactly. So I think that's a good place to end our journey is in the exotic uh, <laughs> Stadiums of Buenos Aires and beyond. It's a bit more exotic than North Essex, yeah. Than a, yeah, than uh, a demolished you know, stadium in North Essex. And Goldstone Ground no longer exists either. So, oh yeah, so, no, um, yeah. I, I worked out. I had a look at look on Google Maps, and I've mm-hmm. worked out now that our seat was probably in what is the frozen storeroom of Lidl. I think. Ooh, yeah. So, okay. uh, so you, you're it's always are us then, but uh, I think it's a little. Amongst the peas and the hash browns, now. exactly. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, being an absolute pleasure, is there one thing that you you still feel is the most crystal clear memory of that first match? Um, let's not mention Michael Robinson again. Is there something that you think, right, that is what really struck me, and that's what got me hooked? Because we were behind the goal, I kind of felt slightly dislocated from it you know and you were saying how the Palace fans were being raucous the report said well they were 140 yards away and I didn't really notice yeah. it the, pa- the Brighton fans would have been much noisier I'd have had those sure. all sorts of surrounds so you're saying not to go back to Michael Robinson but I have to go back to him and it was it was the, it's the it's the delight in the in the, the PA announcer's voice this is what it is because up till yeah. then I'd, I'd taken sport by TV where the BBC commentators the ITV commentators are impartial and so you know they were the official word and so they hear an announcement and it's it's just a voice who's just saying you know rather than the scorer for Brighton Hove Albion it's Michael Robinson yeah. it was the score for you know the jubilation in his voice I was going yeah. is that allowed because I was used, so used to everyone <laughs> having to be objective and unbiased yeah after and I remember just 40 seconds later Michael Robinson you skanking mm. That that's that that you know I can still hear that guy's voice. I don't know why, but um I can't remember the goals so much. Jerry Murphy's got to remember. Yeah. Michael Robinson's I can't really remember the others. But uh but that voice, that voice is if all these things are imprinted on my brain, that's that's the soundtrack that they're they're uh, they're revolving around to. Okay, fine. So that's the final dagger in my heart. Thanks very much for that. <laughs> and I really appreciate your you're doing that and really burying it nice and deep. Thank so you, thank um you. 
It's been an absolute pleasure. And as I thank say, you, it's Richard. Thank lovely you. to go through all those experiences with you. And um, yeah, appreciate your time. Well, thank you for asking me. It's an absolute pleasure.